Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Good morning, church. Good morning to our friends gathered out in Hebron. Glad we're all together today. Uh, when I was 22 years old, uh, I, I served as a missionary in Northern Ireland for, for a period of time. And, and, and initially, when I moved to Northern Ireland, I had the, the honor of having a roommate uh, by the name of Hector, who was 86 years old. Um, so quite a contrast in ages between me and Hector. Uh, his his, his uh, 83-year-old wife, Evelyn, had actually crashed our bachelor pad. Um, and so that was uh, a bit of a bummer. Really, they had been married for 60 years, so I crashed their home. Um, but uh, regardless, I, I really enjoyed hanging out with Hector. We, we had some wild times. Uh, we got pretty rowdy in bed by 8 p.m. every night. Um, and so, uh, but he was really, really great. Um, Hector was an incredible human being. Uh, Hector, uh, every single day, uh, walked the entirety of the, the, the small town that we lived in. He, he'd walk up and down each street and uh, he'd stop in front of shops and, and, and many assumed that it was just for, for exercise, but Hector would be quick to tell you that that was just a byproduct of his daily walks. The real purpose of those walks uh, was that he would pray. He would pray for his town. He would pray for each shop. He would pray for the shop owner by name because he had taken the time to learn all of these things. He'd pray for people he knew, people he didn't know. He'd pray for every single person he crossed on the street. Uh, Hector was very, very devoted to this practice of prayer. Uh, Hector was also one of the most joyful people I've ever met in my entire life. He, he, he literally found ways to take joy in absolutely everything, even some of life's most mundane activities. Every morning when I'd get up, I'd come downstairs into the kitchen and Hector would be sitting at the table. His Bible uh, would be open and nearby and he would typically be eating a piece of toast and he would excitedly tell me good morning and I'd ask him every day, Hector, what are you going to do today? And he, he he would just from, you know, on top of the world share what, what he was getting into that particular day. And it was always very, very normal stuff, very, very simple stuff, like the stuff we all take for granted. But Hector was just so excited about all of those things. One of his favorite days of the week was the, the, the one day each week that he would go to the grocery store. And he was just overcome with excitement to go to the grocery store. And, and it, was, it was odd. And so I finally just asked him, like, Hector, why do you like the grocery store so much? Like, what is it that's so fun and exhilarating about it? And he's like, oh, it's the faithfulness of the Lord. And I was like, Hector, I'm not following. What do you mean? And, and he'd say, I love going to the grocery store each week because Evelyn and I, we have a budget and I'm just so excited to see how God is going to meet our needs within that budget. I'm so excited to see what we're going to get to enjoy for the next week. And what I really love is the thrill of getting to the cash register, checking out and realizing there's excess. And now I get to bless somebody with that excess. What a joy it is to go to the grocery store. This was Hector's perspective on literally everything. This is how he looked at all of life's activities. Typically our time at the breakfast table would end by Hector excitedly jumping up and saying, oh my goodness, I now have the joy of going to brush my teeth. And he would sing all the way in to the bathroom as he brushed his teeth. 
Hector was somebody that had a full grasp of the disciplines of reflection and rejoicing. Uh, and, and it was hard, you know, when you looked at Hector's life to, to, to understand which informed which. Was it his reflecting that, that spurred his rejoicing or was it the rejoicing that ignited his, his discipline of reflection? They, they were consistently interchangeable. Um, and, and that's good. I, I think that's actually important for us to notice, especially in this series that we're in called Teach Us to pray. This, this series is all about prayer. It, it's about taking something that can be very, very mysterious and hopefully making it far more approachable, seeing it as the gift that it truly is. And, and the title, Teach Us to Pray, comes from a simple request on the part of Jesus' disciples. They, they looked at his life and they could tell what, what, what a commitment prayer was for him, how, how dedicated and fully devoted he was to the practice of prayer. And, and, and they saw the, the fruit that it yielded in his life. And so finally one day they said, Jesus, teach us to pray the way that you do. He introduced uh, what, what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer, which is very much guiding us through this series. But we're also using a very, very simple acronym. And, and I explained last week when it comes to this acronym, which is simply PRAY, that, that, that this is a way to pray. It's not the only way to pray. If you're new to prayer or you're looking to, to enliven or refresh your prayer life, this can be a really, really useful tool. Each letter stands for a different word. Pause is what we talked about last week. The discipline of pausing in prayer, of, of enjoying the stillness of the Lord, being pulled out of the busyness, chaos of life, and, and just enjoying the presence of the Lord. This week, we're going to talk about reflecting, rejoicing. Next week, we'll talk about what it is to ask in prayer. And then finally, we'll close out the series by talking about what it means to yield in prayer, to give God complete control. And, and so that's kind of where we're going. That's the trajectory we're on. As I said, we're on the R this week talking about reflecting and rejoicing. And much like in the life of Hector, if you comb through scripture, you will find that these terms are, are very much linked. They're very much uh, 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 in a tandem effect throughout scripture. They're also a major emphasis, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, the entirety of the Old Testament, uh, it's hard to, to not see it as a simple reflection on who God is, on what God does and what God desires to continue to do in and through his people. And the concept of rejoicing is there all along, especially in, in a book like the book of Psalms. It's actually harder to find Psalms that don't include some charge or reminder to rejoice than, than it is to list the ones that do. These are constant themes throughout Scripture and they very much carry over into the New Testament, especially in passages like, like the one our scripture readers read for us today, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. This is, this is where we're going to kind of camp out today. I want to dig into these verses. I, I think they, they really help us wrap our head around the discipline of reflection and rejoicing, especially within the context of prayer. And so here's, here's how I want to do this. We're, we're going to take it two verses at a time, four verses in, in total. The first two verses, I think Paul does a really good job of laying out kind of what the goal is of what I would call the rejoice lifestyle, what, what, what the goal of that is. And then the next two verses, verses six and seven, really uh, kind of lay out how we step into that lifestyle, what it is that we can do tangibly to to better discipline ourselves to live in these disciplines of reflect and rejoice. And so we're going to start with the first two verses. So if you have a Bible, uh, we'll be in Philippians chapter four, verses four and five to start out. Let me remind you what they say. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. A couple things I, I want to point out here. First and, and foremost, uh, when Paul says rejoice in the Lord always, and then he immediately reemphasizes, says, again, I will say rejoice. Really, really important that we notice that he's laying this out as a command. Something that is, that is absolutely necessary for us, something we should all take seriously. He wants us to see it that way, that this call to rejoice, this call to reflect and allow that to fuel rejoicing and celebration and adoration of the Lord, that this should be something we approach very much as a command, by, as something that is very, very necessary to our spiritual health. And that's because it's a crucial component of the first and greatest commandment. You go way back in the Old Testament. God led his people out of Egypt and began telling them, this is who you were created to be. The very first thing he tells them is you must love the Lord your God with absolutely everything in you. 
And so what Paul is trying to help us connect is to realize that rejoicing, the discipline of reflection, they're very much tied to this greatest commandment that we've been called to. The idea of allowing ourselves to love the Lord our God with absolutely everything in us, rejoicing and reflection become crucial components that help make that happen. Second thing we need to notice, Paul goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all. It's easy to hear that as Paul almost kind of changing the subject or or listing off random pieces uh, of advice that aren't necessarily connected to one another. That would be an extreme error. This this charge comes right out of the call to be people who rejoice. They're very much tied together. You you see that, that word gentleness is used a lot throughout the New Testament to describe the followers of Christ. It's a hard word to define, especially when you translate it to to gentleness because of how we would typically view gentleness. There's actually a word that it better translates to, but it's not very modern. And in fact, in our modern context, we kind of operate on a different definition of this word, but it's the word meek. You see, if you were to look at a modern dictionary, the word meek is often associated with weakness. It it, it literally is defined in our context as somebody who's easily overtaken, but that's not what biblical meekness really looks like. You see, biblical meekness is somebody who lives in a balance, a balance of the power that they possess, but the humility they choose to live in. Okay, it's somebody that's not uh, easily overtaken because they can't defend themselves. It's somebody who could be overtaken because they choose not to defend themselves. They choose not to exercise the power that they possess. Instead, they lean into humility in the form of sacrifice. There is no better embodiment of this than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who willingly laid down his life as a sheep being led to the slaughter on behalf of us. Jesus Christ who sacrificed himself on behalf of the lost. This is what we're ultimately called to embody when we talk about meekness, the demeanor, the mentality of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is really saying here is let your meekness, let your demeanor and mentality of Jesus Christ be known to everyone, but it's very much coming out of the previous command. Let your rejoice lifestyle have an inside and outside effect on you. Let it change the way you operate. Let it change the way your, ha- your, your heart responds to the Lord and let it radiate into your external life. When people see you, let them see this rejoicing in the form of taking on the character, the mentality, the demeanor of Jesus Christ. This is who we're called to be. And this is why Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, verse 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. It is these who take on the demeanor of Jesus who will be entrusted with leadership as God's kingdom is unfolded. And so it's a pivotal aspect of our calling. And then finally, Paul reminds us that the Lord is near. This is a very, very common saying in the early church. It was a constant reminder. You see, many after the cross, you know, in the wake of everything that had just happened as the church is born and begins to explode and begins to spread, many believe that it was within that first generation of the church that Christ was going to come back, that he was going to come back and he was an usher in heaven and that all that stuff that we live in anticipation of was going to happen. That first generation thought it's going to be within our lifetime. So then when it wasn't, many began to doubt. And Paul, who wrote primarily to the second and and even into the third generation of the church, he, he, he would constantly remind people, hey, don't forget, Jesus is coming back. I know it hasn't happened yet. And I know the longer it goes, the more you begin to wonder and fear that it's not going to happen. He's coming. He's coming soon. And this reminder was meant to, to urge the church to be ready, not just vigilant, not just watchful, but ready in terms of being active and diligently working towards the mission that Christ has entrusted us with. We want to be prepared when our king emerges. We want to be diligently working towards what he has set out before us. 
And so all these reminders put together, these, these three points that Paul makes in these first two verses, I think helps us, helps us capture uh, an overarching goal when it comes to this rejoice lifestyle that's anchored in reflecting on the Lord. Here's how I would define the rejoice lifestyle. This is our goal. It's to live in a constant state of celebration of the Lord that transcends circumstances. So it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what we're up against. We live in this celebration no matter what. And it also provokes a continual internal and external transformation. So all these things that Paul just said, they're all happening. They're all firing on all cylinders because we live in this rejoice lifestyle. Doesn't matter what gets thrown at us. Doesn't matter the ups and downs of life. We are constantly being renewed and transformed internally. We're constantly being renewed and transformed transformed externally. We are living in this constant rhythm of rejoicing. That is the goal. So how do we do that? Well, I think the next two verses really help us capture some some simple mentalities, some some simple uh, points, some simple disciplines that can help us live in this rhythm of rejoicing. And so I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to draw out three things that I think we need to capture today. Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Three things that we need to pull out of this. Three things that help us anchor our lives in this rejoice lifestyle, being the people that God has called us to be, embodying Christ as we were designed to embody Christ. First one is simply this, starve anxious feelings. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. We, we need to cut anxiety off at the source. In the field of biology, there, there are seven agreed upon signs that indicate whether or not something is alive. If something is alive, it will display these seven things. And one of those seven things is that living things grow. If there's no growth, then, then you can immediately begin to doubt life. Now, some things grow very, very slowly. Some things grow very, very rapidly. But there should be chartable growth if something is alive. And when it comes to things that grow, there are many factors that help them grow. There are many things that escalate the growth. But one of the, the vastly most uh, agreed upon uh, contributors to growth is that living things that grow eat. When you eat, you grow. When you're young, you eat as much as you want because you're growing a whole bunch. When you get older and you're growing far more slowly and you wanna slow down that growth, you eat less. And so eating things grow. And so you must ask yourself, if we're to starve anxious feelings, if we're to cut them off from their source of life, we gotta ask ourselves, what do these anxious feelings eat? And the ultimate answer to that question, very, very simply, is anxious feelings eat and feast upon and grow from sin. Now, but we can't just leave it there. It's actually too simple. If we just leave it there, it's only going to produce more anxious feelings. If I were to just say, hey, you'll never feel anxious feelings again if you just stop sinning, you're probably going to feel anxious about the fact that you can't stop sinning. And so it's just going to perpetuate the cycle. So we got to break it down more than that. We got to look at what sin actually does. And I've argued for a long time, I've believed for a long time that, that, that sin ultimately manifests itself at its root in three ways, fear, doubt, and pride. And I think w with each of these things, there's some common questions that cause us to kind of fall down the sin rabbit hole. When it comes to fear, ultimately, fear entrenches itself in our hearts, starting with the question of what if evil is stronger than we thought it was? What if it's bigger? What if it's badder? What if it's more capable than we imagine that it was? What if fear, what if evil actually holds the power and we are simply at its mercy? This is what drives our fear. This is what gives birth to fear. When it comes to doubt, I think it ultimately hinges on the question of what if God is actually weaker than we thought? What if it doesn't matter how much power evil have? What if it's simply based on the fact that God is actually weaker? Or maybe even more terrifyingly, what if God doesn't actually pay as much attention as he claims he does? Or even scarier than that, what if God doesn't actually care as much as he says he does? What if he just chooses to overlook things? What if he chooses just to simply not waste his time on my circumstances? What if God is not as strong or as faithful as scripture promises he is? 
feeds doubt and, and doubt instantly begins to grow. And then when it comes to pride, I, I think it, it, it simply anchored on the question of what if I don't need help anyway? What if, in fact, I could actually be better on my own? What if I should hold all the power? And that's ultimately what these questions come down to. That's ultimately what these three things come down to. Who holds the control? When it comes to fear, it's the fear that, that, that evil holds the control, that evil is in power. When it comes to doubt, it's the fear that nobody does, that God is going to let it fall through the cracks. When it comes to pride, it's the, the belief that if I don't have the control, then nobody should. It's a fight for control. And the disciplined believer understands that to experience transformation, to experience new life, to live in the rhythm we were created for, it's, it actually comes down to the conscious decision to take that control, that control that we could associate to evil, that we could let fall through the cracks, that we could keep for ourselves, to take that control and consciously give it into the faithful hands of the Father. To give God the control of our lives. That's, that's what we do when we confess Jesus Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we give him the control. And so to starve anxious feelings is as simple as consciously making the decision when they begin to rise that I'm going to give God control of these feelings. I'm going to let them cut them off from their source of life so that they will begin to, to degenerate and eventually die off completely. Now, all sounds super, super simple, but how do we practically do that? Let me give you an example of, of how this works in my own life. Uh, a few years ago, uh, because I'm getting older and because I constantly eat things that want to kill me, I started developing some pretty serious acid reflux. Like it happens, it's one of the joys uh, of growing, uh, growing up. Like you, you start to, like the things you eat start to have this impact on you. So I start having acid reflux and since then, like, you know, figured it out, talked to doctors, I'm on a good medication, like it's very much under control. It's not nearly as big of a distraction as it initially was. When it first set in, I was convinced on a regular basis that I was dying. Like that's just the way uh, acid reflux is. Like the, the terrifying thing about acid reflux is the stuff you experience, the sensations you feel are startlingly similar to how they describe heart attacks. Like it's all the same stuff. Like you feel pain in your chest, sometimes the pain's in your back. Sometimes it creeps into your shoulder and you're like, this is it. This is the big one. I'm about to die. And so every single time acid reflux would set in, I was convinced I was on the verge of a heart attack and I would immediately begin to panic. And immediately these anxious feelings would just take over. And I was, you know, constantly Googling things and overthinking everything and worrying about every little sensation in my body. The anxious, anxious feelings were having their way with me. Now, medication and talking to doctors helped immensely, but the thing that helped more than anything else was prayer. What I began to do was simply ask God, as soon as those anxious feelings came on, I would ask God to take control of the situation. I would consciously make the decision to put God in control. And the way that I would start to do that is I would simply start taking deep breaths. Simplest thing you could possibly do. I mean, breathing, it just happens naturally. You don't even think about it anymore. So I would just consciously do it. I would breathe and I would remind myself, God put that breath there. God is in control of every single one of these breaths. I can't make myself breathe. I don't know how my lungs work. I don't know how to make any of this happen, but God does. He's in control of it. And so I would simply breathe. I'd take deep breaths and I would acknowledge that God is in control. And then I would ask God very, very consciously, very, very deliberately, God, slow down my thoughts and allow me to begin to approach them practically, logically, rather than emotionally. And what this would do is it would allow me to slow down enough that I could start kind of laying things out. First, we looked backwards. God would lead me as we look backwards. And I would ask myself very logically, what have I eaten recently that may be causing me to feel this way? And I'd realize you, you ate a bunch of cheese, you ate peppers, like something like that. Like there was a logical explanation for why I might be having acid reflux right now. And then we would move to the present. Have I taken my medication the way that I'm supposed to take my medication? If the answer was no, then immediately like the feelings would go away. I'm like, this is very, very logical that I feel this way. If the answer was yes, it was like, okay, what else do I need to do? Do I need to drink some water? Like what do I need to do? And then God would lead me forward. We'd begin thinking forward and think, okay, how can I not end up like this again? 
What changes do I need to make? How do I need to be wiser? How do I need to be more diligent going forward? It's a simple way to capture those feelings before they have the opportunity to grow. You cut them off from their food source by transferring the control from those negative emotions like fear, doubt, and pride and placing it in the capable and loving hands of your father. This is how we starve those anxious feelings, by taking every thought captive. And this will immediately lead us into replacement of those thoughts by exercising the next point. And the second thing we need to discipline ourselves to do as we've starved anxious feelings is exercise our gratitude. We need to become people who become very, very good at saying thank you. Become very, very diligent about saying thank you. That look forward to saying thank you. And I want to emphasize that we've used the word exercise to describe this. This is very much an exercise. Exercise causes things to grow. When you exercise, muscles grow. But sometimes in order to get that to start happening, you have to force it at first. Many of you have experienced that. If you've made the decision, okay, I'm not someone who exercises. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start taking better care of my body. It's not like just deciding you want to do that one day just gives you the mental fortitude that you're just full on committed to it. Like initially you got to force yourself to do it. You got to force yourself out of bed. You got to force yourself to put your shoes on. You got to force yourself to put one foot in front of the other. You've got to start building a rhythm and a routine. But pretty soon, if you continue to force yourself to do this, you start to find that rhythm. And then once you find that rhythm, you start to hit a stride. Pretty soon it becomes a lot like breathing. You're just committed to it. And this is the exact same mentality uh, when it comes to exercising gratitude. Initially, you've got to remind yourself to do it. Initially, you may even have to force yourself to do it, but you begin to develop a rhythm. And, and the reason you begin to develop that rhythm is because you begin to widen your perspective. Okay, let, let me give you an example of this from the Psalms. Here's a very, very simple example. Psalm chapter 9. Okay, listen to what David says in the first two verses of this psalm. Okay, it's kind of a declaration. He says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. It's easy to read over. It's easy to glance over. But listen to what David is saying. David is very much telling himself that he's going to exercise his gratitude. He's very much establishing for himself this new rhythm of exercise. He's saying, I will discipline myself to say thank you to God. I will tell of his wonderful deeds. I will make myself be glad and rejoice in him. I will sing the praises of his name. But then look what happens. Look how quickly this becomes a cascade of gratitude. Verses 3 through 10 go on to say this. David begins to look backwards. Notice the tense in this. My enemies turn back. They stumble and perish before you. For you have upheld my rights and my cause, sitting enthroned as the righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken my enemies. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Notice what happens when David starts disciplining himself to say thank you. Immediately he begins to look backward and realize all of the reasons that God deserves our gratitude because he's been continually faithful again and again and again. And so this discipline of gratitude, it begins to force his attention backwards, but immediately it begins to propel it forward. What is David doing all the while by saying thank you for the things that God has done? He's building a sense of trust in what God will continue to do. And I saw this vividly displayed in Hector's life. Hector was somebody that was so committed to saying thank you. That he was so obsessed with thanking God for even the simplest things in life that Hector began looking forward to the opportunity to say thank you. That's why he got so excited about the grocery store. 
because he knew on the other side of it, he was gonna get to thank God for the grocery store. He didn't even know what was gonna happen at the grocery store yet, but he knew that God would be faithful because God had always been faithful. Because of this discipline of gratitude, because he exercised it day in and day out, simply by saying thank you for everything he could possibly thank God for, it widened his perspective. He became more noticeable of God's faithfulness and he lived in a greater sense of anticipation for the fact that God would continue to be faithful. That is the definition of trust. And that's what we're trying to build. A constant belief that God is good because he's always been good. And therefore, we believe wholeheartedly that he'll continue to be be good. And when you live in that belief, that anticipation that God will continue to be good, it fuels an immense amount of peace. And that's our third discipline is to celebrate that peace. That peace that, that naturally grows out of our trust being fully placed in the Lord. We need to notice it. We need to enjoy that peace. We need to savor that peace. We need to celebrate it as often as we possibly can. And again, there are countless examples of this in the scriptures, especially in the book of Psalm, but maybe most notably the most famous Psalm, Psalm 23. Listen to these words. Listen to this celebration of peace. It all begins with verse 1 where David makes the declaration, the Lord is my shepherd. There's no greater declaration of trust than to say that God is my shepherd. Sheep were were completely indebted to the care of their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. David has realized that because he's placed his trust fully in the hands of the Lord, that there is nothing in this life that he lacks. He has absolutely everything he could need or desire. And then listen to this, listen to the celebration of peace that comes out of this. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This peace that David had come to enjoy, this peace that he's come to to, to savor, this peace that he was committed to continually celebrating, this peace was producing something in David's heart. It's the same thing it was producing in the heart of men like Hector. It's the same thing it can produce in our hearts. It's it's simply this, it's confidence. Confidence, not in ourselves, certainly not in our circumstances. Confidence in a faithful God, a God who continues to show up, a God who makes peace an opportunity for us, a God that provides a refuge, a God who really does lay us down in green pastures of life and give us moments to rest, gives us moments of refreshment, a God who is committed to us. It's a stride that I want to walk in. I want to live in this rhythm for the Lord because there is so much promise of life giving peace there. I want God to have his way in me so that I can simply enjoy this peace. Now, everything we just unpacked, Christ said far simpler in the prayer that he taught his disciples. It's simply the line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It invites us into the exact same journey. Here's how I would encourage us to pray that aspect of the prayer. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done in me and through me. And understand when you ask God to do that, When you ask God to to, to bring about his kingdom and his will in you and then through you, what you are ultimately asking God to propel you into is this inside, outside transformation that Paul is talking about in Philippians 4. That means it begins with taking all of those anxious feelings captive by the power of the Lord. It, It leads us into the exercise of gratitude on a daily basis so that we can celebrate and enjoy peace. That's what we're asking God to do when we say unleash the kingdom in my heart. This is what the kingdom does. The kingdom is a light that chases away darkness. 
The kingdom is a stronghold that gives peace to all of those who find refuge in the name of Jesus Christ. The kingdom is a reminder that God has been in control, that God is in control, that God will remain in control. The kingdom is bringing peace to all of the world's chaos. This is what we've been invited into. But what I would remind us of firmly as we close is Paul's reminder that the Lord is near. Paul said that, and that that, that line was shared amongst the early church to give a sense of urgency. So what Paul is saying here is that the invitation into peace is something that, that, that God is urgently focused on for his people. God doesn't want to just use you as a worker bee. God doesn't want you just diligently, actively bringing about his kingdom as a pawn in a larger game. God's diligent and urgent desire for you is that you would experience this peace. That you would know green pastures here and now where you can find rest, spiritual rest, physical rest, mental rest. God wants to lead you into rest. He wants to lead you beside quiet waters now. He wants to refresh your soul now. He wants to guide you on the right path now. He wants to protect you in the darkest valley you could experience now. He wants to prepare a table for you even in the midst of your enemies here and now. He wants to anoint your head with oil. He wants your cup to overflow. He wants you to know that goodness and love will in fact follow you the rest of the days of your life if you exist in his heart and that you will dwell in his house forever. He wants to instill all of those things in your heart now urgently. He wants that. And his urgent desire for us is that we would use prayer as a means by which we can come into this proximity of the Lord to where all of this can take place in us and through us beginning here and now. This is what the King of the universe desires for you. And this is what he's invited us into through the gift of prayer. And it begins with disciplines as simple as making time to rejoice by reflecting on just how good our God is. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for your truth. God, I thank you so much that that, that your word is such a powerful chronicle of everything you have done. God, the ways that you've shown up for your people, ways you've offered protection, ways you've extended forgiveness. But Lord, we know that those are not things you simply did then. Those are things that you continue to do now continue to show up for your people. You continue to deliver your people. You continue to extend forgiveness and mercy and grace to your people. And Lord, we are those people. I thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we have a shepherd in which we can be certain that we lack nothing. We can find rest in green pastures. We can live life beside quiet waters. Our souls here and now can be refreshed by the presence of the Lord. And what a gift prayer is to that end. What an opportunity to be reminded of who God is, of what God does, and what God desires to do in and through us. Then to meet him in prayer by rejoicing on what he has done, by reflecting on his faithfulness, by being pulled into your presence, Lord. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.